simple answer to the question is clearly not. But this podcast, I always like to go into the nuance and make sure you understand the kind of key elements when it comes to safeguarding yourself, let's say, against injury when it comes to running. Hello and welcome back to the Smart Strength Training Podcast. So this is the podcast that I discuss all things evidence-based when it comes to fitness and nutrition. And today's topic is running. And very specifically, a statement that was made to me that is running inherently bad for your knees. So for episode 24, I want to tackle that question. I guess a better way of uh, framing that question is, is running inherently going to cause lower limb injuries? Because it isn't just knees that people might have an issue with when it comes to running. But First up, I want to make a statement because running is the single most participated fitness activity in the world. And a 2019 report by the International Health and Racket Sports Association stated that around 50 million people in the US alone identified as a runner or a jogger. And on a global scale, estimates from running organizations estimate that around 100 million people engage in running recreationally every single year. So if running is inherently bad for your joints, why do so many people? Um, If every single runner was having major, major pain when it came to their joints, it wouldn't be as popular. So the simple answer to the question is clearly not. But this podcast, I always like to go into nuance and make sure you understand the kind of key elements when it comes to safeguarding yourself, let's say, against injury when it comes to running. Because the really important thing to understand is the main challenge lies in the fact that your bones, tendons, ligaments, and all other connective tissue adapt to training stress much slower than your muscular system and your aerobic system. When we work out, we place a physical stress on the body that creates either damage or a need to recover. And then via blood flow, that brings nutrients to the area, such as proteins and other cellular building blocks. But if you think about those pretty anatomy books you've ever seen, you'll notice that the muscles are always very red and they'll come down to like white tendons, white ligaments. And that's for a very specific reason, because those white structures do not have the blood supply, which is why they can't be colored red. And for any meat eaters out there, you know this when you're cutting through a steak, for example, you'll find those little white sinewy bits of fascia and connective tissue. Those structures are white because they receive less blood flow and therefore less nutrients for recovery. So you have to recognize the sort of rate in ability to repair to stress. Tendons, joints, connective tissue have a much slower rate. And individuals that are most prone to injury when it comes to running are typically going to be beginners. Those in their first year, maybe first three years of running, or people that push it to the extreme. I'm sure you've probably seen or you probably even know people that do some sort of ultra event. There are a plethora of running-based endurance activities. But for the millions of people in contrast that are, they've adapted to running and they they feel pretty good, they built things up, they tend to fare, fare really well. And like I said, there are millions of people that have absolutely no issue with running at all. So the most important factor when it comes to injury prevention for runners is simply gonna be the rate in which you scale your running. Now, of course, I'm a strength coach and often new clients that start working with me potentially are runners. And one of the things I say to me is about using strength training as a target or a way of safeguarding themselves against injury, which is a great thing to do, but that is not going to be the number one way to safeguard yourself against injury. You have to really focus on that rate in which you scale up your running because strength training uh, is still going to primarily target the the muscular system there are great things you can do like plyometrics to increase tendon strength um but again regardless of strength training you're still going to end up with this time scale to recovery so i'm not saying you shouldn't do strength training of course you could you should do um the rate in which you scale things is much more 
uh, important, which is why a lot of running coaches do advise increasing your distances no more than 10%. Of course, that guideline is super generic. It's not going to work for everyone, but it provides an insight into how gradual progression should be. Because it's really common when you're speaking to like novice runners, they'll build up to a 5K and then I say, right, I'm going to try and do a 10K. And that is wild. If you think of that in any other context, if someone had built up to a 50 kilo deadlift, it would make logical sense. You wouldn't double the load and jump to 100 kilos. But recognize that going from 5K to 10K is just far too big an increase. And that's often why a lot of people will end up getting injured, certainly in those first a few years and it's also really important to recognize for not just novices i guess for everyone if you are totally sedentary and your body is ex exposed to very minimal physical stress day to day this will mean that you have detrained your body i spoke about this two episodes ago like about rates of muscle loss so if we're not doing anything our body will adapt to the stresses we're placing upon it which is nothing so therefore our muscles will become weaker, our tendons will become weaker still. So if you're the sort of person that goes from sitting down 10 hours a day and you wanna take up running as your way to get fit, recognize that shift in stimulus is vast. And I think we don't respect how much more force is going through our joints when we go from a walking gait to a running gait. So ground force reaction or ground force contact, let's say, the amount of force going through the joint when you're on one foot is roughly calculated at 2.5 times body weight. And that's per stride. And the average running cadence, so running stride, is around 160 to 180 steps per minute. So you do the math on that, which is a really underappreciated element of running, is that hitting the ground, jumping from one foot to the, to the other, because there is that difference between walking gait, where you always have one foot on the floor, and running gait, where at one moment in time, both feet are off the floor. So it can be much smarter for people that are very sedentary to start off walking, maybe incline walking, and maybe loading your walking with either a weighted vest or like a ruck, a bag with some load in it to build up that conditioning for the connective tissue before stepping into um, more running distance. And the other thing as well, just to be aware of that, as people start to get labored in their running mechanics, as you get tired towards the latter stage of your run, I'm sure you felt this yourself, that your, your stride becomes more labored and you shorten that stride length. That really can promote a heel strike and that heel strike can increase that ground force reaction further. And I think this is one of the things around running as a whole, because I think when a runner thinks of building up their distance, it's always around cardiovascular fitness. I want to get more aerobically fit. So of course, the more that you run, the fitter you'll get. And that's fine, but you have to again recognize that the, the joints, they're going through their own process when it comes to their ability to recover. So potentially a smarter thing to do could be to use something like a Stairmaster or maybe an elliptical to build some level of aerobic fitness whilst you're also doing your runs. So you're not just using your running to build that fitness. You can do things like cycling as well. There is, of course, a specificity when it comes to exercise selection. If you're getting very bike fit, it's not going to transfer perfectly over onto the road. But what I will say is if you're going from zero to running versus going from being bike fit to running, then you're, of course, going to notice a big difference in just your general fitness as a whole. So it's really important to recognize that the ability to push your aerobic system is going to be much, much quicker with running than that ability to recover from the stresses of those impacts. So it isn't just about thinking of how much you can push your heart. You have to also recognize those joints as well. And the problem will come that maybe you don't always recognize it from pain from your joints. Um, it will come or it can come as a delayed response over time. So just sort of respecting that time course, I'd always suggest people to, yes, do some strength training, Yes, do some running that's scaled, but also have some good aerobic training in there that is either low or no impact to help build your aerobic capacity as you push things along. So as I mentioned at the start, sort of, it's not just about 
knees. Obviously, there are other injuries that people can um, get from, or let's not say from running, but there are other lower limb injuries that are problematic, which can arrange, uh, involve the feet. So things like plantar fasciitis, maybe Achilles tendonitis, some IT band injuries and issues as well, maybe some pelvic and hip um, structure issues and lower back. But of course, the most common one is going to be um, knees. One proposed solution to this is going to be footwear. Um, there are, of course, lots of trainers on the market that can help support different running gait patterns. Um, and it's big business. So making sure you have a pair of trainers that do help with your running stride. And then of course, if you are running a bit more frequently and you're increasing your mileage, then trying to make sure that you change your footwear fairly regularly to make sure that your, your trainers are helping. Um, but that's not gonna help everyone. If you've ever spoken to a runner, some people that seems to work really well for, for others, it doesn't make any difference at all. And then of course, if we're on the conversation of footwear, this brings in things like barefoot or minimal footwear that you see on the market today. And interestingly, things like, well, the topic of barefoot running is something that I've done a bit of a 360 on with my thoughts over the years, because certainly when I was first exposed more into the biomechanics of lower limbs, it did make logical sense that we would have evolved in barefoot. So therefore, shouldn't we all be walking around barefoot and using minimal footwear? And actually, my, uh, my good friend and physio, Jonathan Codling, he always likes to keep my ego in check and uh, play devil's advocate because there actually isn't the research support that um, that minimal footwear would be preventative of any lower limb injury. And often the, the idea of the rationale behind why barefoot running should be taken up by more people is often based on like tribes. So tribes like the Hudsa tribes or the, uh, the Terra Matra who spend their entire life barefoot. They run for miles and walk for miles in barefoot and have little to no issues with lower limb injuries. But of course, these tribes, they spent their entire life, they've grown up starting barefoot, they're walking around day to day barefoot. So we have to recognize as modern runners, we haven't exposed our lower limbs to that type of stimulus. We're not walking around and running around on gravel and sand. Um, and you wouldn't want to, and you, and you couldn't do that. It wouldn't make logical sense. And of course, the average runner is probably running on hard, very consistent surfaces. Um, so we're very much adapted to that hard structures. Whereas if you were running around, um, you would, or you were, if you're in a tribe running around, they could be running around across different kinds of surfaces. So this kind of modern running phenomenon is very, very different to the sort of tribes that are often stated when it comes to the benefits of, uh, of barefoot running. So I'm definitely not an advocate for barefoot runners, but I do think it's worthwhile investigating the right kind of footwear. So really to summarize this, uh, I wanted to keep this one pretty short and sweet. The rate in which you increase your running is going to be the most important thing. I appreciate this can be quite frustrating um, because often I find myself trying to hold runners back a little bit and try and dose response things, especially if a client is working with me that's had previous history of injury. And I guess what I really like is that if you have someone that does have or has had knee pain and maybe has been told they can't do marathons again and can't do certain distances again, the nice thing is that actually, I mean, across the course of my career, I've seen it so many times that if you just dose the runs at the right amount and when people do start to feel any kind of issues, just backing off a little bit um, before building things back up is a really great way. You don't need to be on the best like strength training program to do that, you actually can do that all yourself. Second point is build up that cardiovascular activity outside of running if that's possible. I do appreciate that running is so widely used because it's so accessible, I don't need to have access to a gym. But certainly if you are either concerned about your joints or you've had previous history of injury, I would strongly advise doing some other form of low to no impact activity 
to build that running fitness up and not just use running alone. Another thing I would say is uh, using incline walking, rucking or some sort of loaded walk as a really great way to prepare the joints before you start doing lots of long runs. And if you are starting to run and your fitness isn't great and you notice that when you get labored, that sort of that heel stripe becomes more prominent, you feel that sort of more jarring impact. I would ma massively suggest to bring that right down to a, a walking pace using more of like an interval walk run in that situation should be a really smart thing to do. So you're not exacerbating that impact and that ground force action that we spoke about earlier. Um, finding the right shoes that work for you or feel good for you and then changing them semi-frequently, especially if you're doing a lot of running. Um, and if it's possible to alternate your running surfaces, that's not always gonna be um, practical for a lot of people, but if you can run on grass and not always be on, on tarmac and on concrete, that can be a really nice way to change the, the landing style and to change the surface that you're on. Thinking about the foot just generally as I finish up, there are 26 bones in the foot, 33 joints. And those bones are designed to mold to the ground that we're on. And we have to recognize that that doesn't happen anymore. We often we are wearing choked shoes or we're on hard surfaces. So a lot of the natural design of the foot does get lost a little bit. So if there is a chance to change the surface that you can run on and to do that fairly regularly, I would definitely suggest that for the runners that have accessibility to it. So I hope that was useful and there were some good takeaway tips from it. Like I said at the very start, running definitely is not inherently bad, but if you are new to running, I do think you need to be a little bit mindful how quickly you scale your running distance.